part three of intentionality. This is a six-part series that we've said, hey, it's the beginning of the year. And so it's at the beginning of the year, let's just think about how our lives could be if, if we would be intentional. Let's think about what could we do with 2016 if we were to make this our most intentional year ever. We started out by talking about be aware. Be aware. Just be aware about what's going on in the lives of others. Move slowly enough through life that you know what's happening with others. Celebrate with them. Cry with them. Be present with them. That this matters. Last week we looked at this idea of be square. With the idea of be square of, of there's a calendar that, that we should look at each one of those squares and we should, we should look at that and go, hey, how could I live my life with the most intent, with the most purpose, making the most of everything? That we looked at, at, at this instruction that we found that, that, that Paul wrote to a body of believers and said, hey, here's the thing that you need to know. Here's what you need to get. He said, be careful how you live. He said, make the most of every opportunity. And he said, understand. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. That those are three things that, that we need to get and we need to work on trying to make sure that that is us, that we're being careful how we live. We're making the most of every opportunity. And we're seeking to understand what it is that the Lord would want us to do. And today we're going to talk about be saddened. Now, as I think about being intentional, one of the things I think that you guys have been very good about being intentional at is inviting people to come to Cross Point. And I think you've been intentional about making sure that in 2016 that you're not going to miss out on that spiritual development that comes by, by hanging out, coming to church, sing some songs that connect with your Savior, and, and looking in God's Word for instruction. And you guys have done a great job with that. You guys have done a great job of inviting people. In fact, last week, for us at Cross Point, we saw our highest attendance ever on a normal day, a normal Sunday. Not a Christmas, not an Easter, but just a normal Sunday. We had 961 peeps. Yeah. <laughs> And, and it's just because you guys are getting the word out and letting them know, hey, here's a church, here's a place that you could come that's going to be worth your time. And you know what? I know that we're not the only church in the area that that's true of. We're just one of the churches that God is choosing to use because there's a lot of great churches in our area. We're not in competition with other churches. We're in competition with Satan. That's who we're in competition with. It's not the other churches. We're just all working together to see what kind of difference and impact that we can make in our community. So, so this week we're going to talk about be savvy. Well, be savvy. Well, what is that? You know, because we can look at a lot of different areas in life where we might need to be savvy at. So, so what are we talking about this week when we talk about be savvy? Well, maybe this might be the most memorable way that I can put it for you to know what we're talking about today. Money, 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 money. Money. Woo. Good thing I never auditioned for the band. We are. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be savvy when it comes to our money. Because see, when it comes to our money, along with many other things in our life, for us, when we stop and we look, the extent of the efforts that we put into it, they're going to limit the results that we get. That the extent of the effort that we're going to put into it is going to limit the results that we're going to get. And when it comes to being savvy with money, being savvy with money is not about, hey, somebody who's, who's got millions of dollars and, and those are the ones that need to be savvy. That we all need to be savvy. And, and you can be savvy with money if, if you've got a household income of 20000 of 40000 of 70000 And you can be savvy with money if you've got an income of 200000 or 400000 Whatever it is that's coming in, you can be savvy. Because the savviness is about, hey, you being intentional, you being wise, you being calculated with what you're doing with the resources. You see, don't we all know of people, or maybe even know some people, that they're pulling down the 200 and they're pulling down the 400, and yet they are not savvy with their money? That they're foolish with the money that they manage? You know, just because you make a lot doesn't keep you from having money problems. So we have to be savvy. No matter what it is that's coming in, that we need to be savvy, that we need to be intentional. See, financial stress, it catapults our life into chaos. 
Just imagine, as soon as the financial stress comes in, it's like loading ourselves up in this catapult, and we just go fly, and it's like, ah, 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 and we're just going crazy, because it's just chaos. It's instant chaos. We don't know where we're going to land, how we're going to land, how damaged we are when we do come down. Because financial stress, it just catapults our lives right into chaos. See, that financial stress, if, if that financial stress comes into our life, and, and probably if we're all honest, we probably have all experienced financial stress before. Maybe some are in it right now. Maybe you've already come out of that season and you vowed to never go back and you're working hard, whatever the case may be. But when it comes to being that one that's having to deal with financial stress, it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's, it's when your phone starts ringing and you don't recognize the number. You're like going, I'm, I'm, I'm not answering that. Because the last thing you want to do is talk to another bill collector. That the, the mail, the mail just piles up. You know, it used to be content with just waiting five or six days to go get it. But when there's financial stress, it's kind of like, you know, once or twice a month is okay to go get the mail. Because you just don't want to see what's coming in the box. That stress of going, well, how, how am I going to keep the electricity on? That stress of, what are we going to do to be able to, to keep the water coming? They were already three months behind, and they're already giving us a disconnect notice, and that stress is there. Maybe for you, that stress is not in those realms. Maybe, maybe it's a little differently than that. Maybe it's not so much that you're not able to, to stress over. You don't have to stress about being able to provide food, being able to keep the lights on, being able to keep water flowing. But maybe that stress comes in when it comes to transportation and all of a sudden, that, that things are so tight, but what you're using for transportation is, it's failing you. And it's going to leave you stranded. And you're like going, but I don't know what I can do. I can't pay to fix it, and I can't buy something else. Maybe you've even been okay in the, those realms. And maybe you're that parent, and you've enjoyed those young years with your kids. And now that they're in their mid-teen years, you're starting to face the reality of, of college is around the corner. And you told them when they were younger, we're going to pay for it. We're gonna do, we, we don't want you to have to carry that burden. But you look right now and you're like going, oh, but we don't know how. I, I'm not sure how this is going to happen, how we're going to be able to do this. But you're capped out. There's no way you can get any more loans. It's just the stress of the financial burdens that are coming in. And out of, out of control finances, out of control finances, when, when we get to the point where our finances are just out of control, there's a, there's, a, there's a hangover that comes with it. And the hangovers that are there is, is pain and shame. That they're just there, they just linger. That, that we feel the pain of not knowing how we're going to provide and what we're going to do next how we're going to make ends meet, and we feel the shame. The shame is other people looking at us and just, we don't have our acts together. We're so desperate. And maybe, maybe for you this morning, you're thinking, I was just coming to church today because I just needed to get away. I just needed to be encouraged. I just needed to be lifted up. I, I just needed to know everything is going to be okay. And yet, the message is about where all of my chaos is just raining right now. Then this is a good day for you to be here. Because I want to share with you, there are some things that you could be doing that you don't have to live with financial chaos. And I know that when we find ourselves there, the solution we're looking for is we want a microwave solution. But a lot of times when there's financial chaos, the solution, it moves at the pace of the crock pot. It's not fast. But it can happen. And it can get there. It's going to take work. It's going to take focus. It's going to take being intentional. But I believe that we can all get there. I like what Thomas Jefferson said. And he said, never spend your money before you have it. Never spend it before you have it. Make sure that it's there. Make sure it's in your hand. It's in your bank. 
before you ever commit to spending it. A dysfunctional relationship with money, it brings despair to our finances. That when we just keep functioning in this dysfunctional way and the way that we're trying to manage our money and use our money, it will bring despair to our finances. And so we need to get control of our finances. We need to be savvy. And so if you're somebody that you're just struggling financially, that you're overwhelmed when it comes to the finances, my goal is that you would move from being overwhelmed to being in control. Being Move from being overwhelmed with where you're at with your finances to being in control of your finances and experience the peace of being in control. So I want to give you a list. And then the list that I want to give you this morning is, is five bad money habits that I've broken. That I'm going to share with you five bad money habits that were very true to me and my life and how I was living it and how I was managing or mismanaging the finances. But I woke up about a dozen years ago to where I was at financially and what was going on and realized some things needed to change. Now, when, when this began to happen and I began to, to just see the light and began to go, things got, have to be different, I, I, I've got to change. When I started talking with Cheryl about this, one of the things that Cheryl said is she said, I, I've been praying for years that God would put us on the same page financially. Now, this just shows that the gentleness of her spirit. Because I wasn't praying to God very much about our family finances. But if I would have been, my prayer would have been something more like this. God, please help Cheryl to see that I'm the spiritual leader of this home. <laughs> and that, that I'm the one in charge and I'm supposed to be making these decisions to help, and so that she'll get on board. Now, that would have been a foolish prayer for me to pray, so I'm glad that I never prayed that prayer. But I do want to share with you that, that there are some things, and it's taken me several years for some of these, and others came pretty quickly, of where I came along and I said, these are, these are bad money habits, and, and I have to, to break them. I, I'm not willing to let these continue in my life or for our family. Number one, bad man, money habit one, making purchases based on monthly payments. It's a bad money habit that I had. And, and I'd be that guy that I would be like, okay, it's time for a new car. You know, I went through car like people go through candy. And so it was just like, it was time for a new car. And I'm not going to bore you with my, my car stories, but I will tell you this much. That I would, I would set a budget to know, okay, this is what I can afford monthly. And I would go in with a conviction of, if I'm going to buy a car, four years. Four years is what I'm going to finance it for. But I go car shopping and I start seeing things that I thought, wow, I deserve. I should have. I certainly would be able to enjoy. But I've set my budget. I, I'm not willing to go over this monthly. You know, those sales guys are so helpful. <laughs> well, did you ever realize that you could actually put this car in a five-year note if you need to? I hadn't thought about that. I just, I thought I need to stick with four. Thank you. And I just made decisions based on the monthly financial commitment. It's a bad money habit that I had. And it took me years to break that. Bad money habit number two is spending money before I had it. So how did that work for me? Well, I'm that guy that, that doesn't mind using a credit card as long as that bill gets paid in full at the end of the month. That's just me. Dave Ramsey and I just don't see eye to eye on that one. Okay, I'm just okay as long as I know I can pay it off every month. And I've, I've always been that guy that's believed a credit card should be paid off at the end of the month when your cycle comes due. But where I would push myself and push those limits would be there'd be some great sales that would happen at times. Or just the timing of something breaking. And, you know, whenever something breaks, you know, for me, that it's always been this invitation to upgrade. Right? Hey, it, it, it's, it broke, it's broken. And it, I need to have a new one. And, 
it's just a good time to upgrade. And so you end up spending what you didn't even plan on spending, but you spend more because it's a time to upgrade. But this is what I would do. I would go out and I'd calculate and I'd look to see, okay, will we have enough money by the time the bill comes in? Will we have enough deposits come in that I'll be able to pay this off when it comes due? And so I would charge stuff that I didn't have the money to pay for when I charged it. Cheryl was extremely uncomfortable with that. And I was like, oh, we'll manage it. We'll manage it. We'll make it happen. And, and, and very rarely did I ever miss that. Rarely. But there were times that I did. And it would always cost us more money. Bad money habit number three. Ignoring my savings and emergency funds. Just ignoring them. We're young. This is the time that we should be enjoying. And so if we start putting that stuff aside now, we're not going to be able to enjoy now. And so I just did. For years, I ignored the savings and the emergency fund. Bad money habit. Bad money habit number four that I've broken. Increasing my cost of living to match my increase in pay. That when the, the raise came along, whether it was a $90 a month, whether it was $190 a month, it didn't matter. Whatever that raise was, it was like opportunity. And that's how I treated it. And it was just like, okay, now we can start enjoying what? It would be almost like, do you know what we can start enjoying now? And it would be children like, no, me either. Let's go find out. Because it was just going to be, let's increase. More money's coming in, so let's find ways to spend it. Bad money habit. Bad money habit number five. Spending what I should have been investing. Spending what I should have been investing and not taking the time to prepare for our future. It was a bad money habit that I lived with for years that I have finally broken. So we've got a lot of parents in the room. Many of the parents in the room are still actively parenting. We've got some parents in the room that you're empty nesters now and, you know, for like the third time or the fourth time or however many times it took to finally get that empty nest. We've got some in the room that you're not a parent yet, whether you're planning on it or whether you're too young to even think about it. But this is what ends up happening to most of us parents. Most of us as parents... We want our kids to have it better than what we've had it. It just, just comes along with the territory of being a parent. Want, wanting the best for our kids and wanting them to have it better than what we've had it, than what we've done. And so one of the things that we try to do as parents is we try to make sure that our kids avoid the mistakes that we've made, right? And, 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 and usually we go about trying to do that by giving them a good old lecture. You know, and, and we finish that lecture and they just walk away all sparkling and glistening and they're excited. They're like, oh, can't wait for another. No, they hate our lectures, don't they? I mean, you, you say two sentences to your kids and what was that? It's a lecture. Because, because their, their tolerance their, their, of, of length for how long it is before a lecture comes along comes really quickly. For us as we've tried to, to look at ways that, that we can help set our kids up to where, where they'll do it better than what we've done it, we, we've tried to be intentional about some things. We've been intentional as parents that, that we've never given our kids an allowance because days on a calendar are past. We just haven't. We, we, we've been parents that have said, hey, if, if you're going to get some money from us and it's not for Christmas and it's not for your birthday, it's not for back to school, then, then you're going to earn it. There, there's going to be things, there's going to be chores, there's going to be responsibilities you're going to have to do in order to get it. We, we've even paid them this commission kind of money based on the quality of the work and the timing in which it was done. Because I think that's how the real world, real world works. It's what we've done. We've tried to be intentional about that. We, we did something this last summer, summer of 2015, that we'd never done before. It was just an experiment that we said, hey, let's try this. And so in the summer of 2015, 
we deposited into each of our kids' account where they have a debit card. We deposited into their account their back-to-school money. And we said, hey, we've put the money in your account. You're going to manage it, and you're going to have to go get it. Whatever school supplies you need, whatever clothing you want, but this is going to be what you have to work with, and we deposit it in their account. It is interesting. It was the very first year that we have not seen all of that money being spent when it comes to back-to-school time. That they ended up going out and getting some things that they wanted and getting some things they needed. But they really liked the idea of having more money in their bank account. So they didn't spend it all. A couple of months ago, Noah, who drives now, told his mama that he wanted to go shopping and wanted her to go with him. So they did. They went off together. And she's like feeling good that, hey, my son still wants to spend time with me. This is great. He's driving it on his own. He still wants to spend time with me. So they go shopping. He needs some jeans, and they get up to the counter, and Noah's looking at Cheryl like, um, you going to pay? And Cheryl's like, I'm not paying. Well, how are we going to get them? You got a debit card? You can pay for them. But I need them. That's why we gave you back to school money so that you could manage what you needed to get to get you through this school year. Start teaching them money. Teaching them. Recently, I sat down with Noah. And this idea is not original to me. That nobody, I didn't figure this out on my own. I actually know somebody that I really value, somebody I trust, really how they manage their money. And I know that they were doing this. And I said, you know what? I, I think that's something we're going to take on. So I sat down with Noah. He's a junior in high school. And I said, Noah, I'm pretty sure that this is what we're going to do when it comes to you going to college. That mom and I are going to deposit the money in your account for you to get your education. So we're going to deposit, and I'm not sure yet if we're going to do that a semester at a time or a year at a time. But we're going to deposit tuition, books, room and board, the expenses that we're prepared to cover for him to have money while he's going to school. And we're going to put that lump in his bank account. And I told him, we're going to do this. I'm pretty sure that this is what we're going to do. Because I want you to understand what it's like to have thousands of dollars in the bank that's already marked for something that you have to manage and that you have to make it last for months. It's about teaching them how to manage money. Now, that might not be the thing that you need to do with your kids. That's not why I'm saying it. I, I don't want somebody texting me in nine months and said, hey, I did that, and now my kid can't go to school next semester. <laughs> Got a nice ride, though. You might like it. I know you like cars. It takes work on the front end of trying to prepare them to where they can take on that kind of responsibility. But it's about being savvy. And whether you know it or not, your kids, my kids, they're, they're all looking to us to see, hey, how, how should we do it? What are, what are you doing with it? And you turned out all right. How are you being savvy? I, I think that there's somebody in our Bible that stands out to me as somebody who is savvy with money that I want us to look at in Luke chapter 19. And in Luke chapter 19, we're going to look at this guy. He, he was really savvy with money, but he had some bad money habits too. He had the bad money habit of coming along and being greedy with his money. Greedy and wanting more. He had a bad money habit called extortion. But he was sure was good at making it. But he had a turnaround moment. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and he made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. And he was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. Now, I don't know if you're educated into how they did taxes back then, but just in case you're not, let me just quickly walk you through. The Romans ruled the land. But the Romans used Jews to collect taxes from the Jews. 
So they would take these Jewish people and they would put them in charge. Zacchaeus is one who is a chief tax collector, which means he's got other tax collectors that works underneath him. So the Romans tell Zacchaeus how much money he needs to be collecting and giving back to the Roman government. So he knows what that amount is, but he also knows what he wants to make. So he tells all the tax collectors that deal directly with the people, he tells them what they need to give him that's got his cut in there. And so they know what they have to be able to produce to hand over, but this is how they're going to make money too. So now they're going to charge even more. And this is how this goes about. And so he has become very rich. Verse 3. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down. He took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. See, everybody thought, hey, if Jesus is going to hang out with anybody, he's going to hang out with those of us that have been being good little Jews. Looking out for each other, caring for each other, being religious. But he went to Zacchaeus' home. It says, meanwhile, although everybody's grumbling about this, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Major turnaround moment for Zacchaeus. I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. Okay, so he's got half left. And if I've cheated anybody out, or maybe another way to think about it, and since I've cheated some people out of their money, I'm going to give them four times as much. You know, I heard this when I was young. It always baffled me. Okay? I, I, I could do simple math when I was young pretty easy. Okay, he took from them, but he's given away half already, but he's going to give them four times as much. He can't do that. He doesn't have enough. That was what I thought as a kid. It wasn't until I was older that I figured it out. He's savvy. You know what he did? He invested this money. He made money with their money. It was now his. And it was easy for him to now give them four times back because of what he has made on their money. Our government's taking a lot of our money. Wouldn't it be nice if they had a Zacchaeus moment? <laughs> Some of us would have an instant savings account. Be like, oh, yeah, let's get the government to read the book of Luke. But this is what he does. And Jesus says, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of of Abraham. What's this? See, God, with an angel, selected one individual named Abram and said, Abram, I, I want to pick you. I want you to be the father of a nation that I'm going to start. Are you willing? And Abram said, yeah. God changed his name to Abraham. And so every Jew considers Abraham father Abraham. Because he was the one that started it all, that God used him. And so he's saying, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. In the way that he's acting. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So let me wrap this up with you this morning. I want to share with you four attitudes to adopt concerning money. That if we're going to be savvy, here's four attitudes to adopt concerning money. Number one, all I have comes from God. That's an attitude that we all need to adopt. All I have comes from God. Maybe you're here and you're going, I don't even know if I believe in God. Well, I, 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 don't, 
I don't know if I can even write that down because I'm not even convinced that God's real. Well, you don't have to be, but he's convinced you're real. He made you. And all you have and all your gifts and all your abilities, he gave them to you. And we need to adopt this attitude that all I have comes from God. Zacchaeus made this crucial discovery, and it changed his life around. Number two, live joyfully within God's current provision. This is what's hard for some of us. It's hard because sometimes we get to see other people that keep advancing and keep getting more and having more, and, and it's easy for us to get jealous and discouraged because we won't stop and just be joyful within God's current provision for our life. And we need to. See, more money doesn't equal greater happiness. It doesn't. And, and somehow along the line, along the way, many of us have convinced ourselves that more money is going to equal more happiness. But then we get a little bit of money that's more, and it doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden we start convincing ourselves, well, there's a magical amount of money that it requires in order for there to, to bring more happiness with it. And maybe, the, maybe there's that sense of jealousy going, and there's three people this last week that got that magical amount. <laughs> Threw a few numbers down, and all of a sudden, they've got half a billion dollars, and wow. But yet, history shares with us the people that get that kind of magical money, they lose loved ones, families that fall apart, they, they, they end up wasting all of their money. They, they become poor financially and relationally. Not very magical. That unless they take some extraordinary effort to avoid that, that's what's going to naturally come down the pipe. Dave Ramsey said, you must gain control over your money or the lack of it will forever control you. We've got to start by being joyful with God's current provision for our life. Number three, honor God. Honor God by giving Him the first tenth of my income. It's an attitude that we all need to adopt, that we would give God our first tenth. It's a win-win proposition. In the book of Malachi, it's in our Old Testament, chapter 3, starting in verse 10. Bring all the tithes, and, and, and a tithe is, is an amount. What's that amount? It's how much? It's a tenth. That's what, that's what tithe means, a measurement. So bring all the tenth into the storehouse where there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insect and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. See, we need to get in the regular rhythm of giving. And to be faithful and give back to God what he has asked us to give to him that we should pay him first, pay ourselves second, and then take care of the financial obligations and responsibilities that we have. This is what we should do. And number four is plan for emergencies and prepare for later years. Plan for emergencies. Emergencies are going to happen. But plan for future years. That if you're not already retired, Hopefully, you're going to live long enough to get there and to enjoy it. But you're going to have to plan for it. And we need to be planning for it. I want to leave you with two questions. Two questions to answer when making financial choices. Question number one. What are my highest financial priorities? What are my highest financial priorities? So this is where a budget becomes very important, that we would budget our money. And if you're a Christ follower, one of your highest financial priorities should be giving God 
his tent. That one of your highest financial priorities should be setting three months of expenses aside and having an emergency fund. Should be one of your highest priorities. And if you're not there right now, then you've got to slow down where you're spending until you can build that up. Because that should be a high priority. It should be a high priority for you to be planning and preparing for your future. These are the high priorities. And then it should be a high priority to take care of your family needs. These are these high priorities. What are my highest financial priorities? Set them, put them in the budget, and live by it. And then question number two that we've got to ask ourselves. Will this jeopardize my highest priorities? That as I'm considering and contemplating making this financial decision, will it jeopardize my highest financial priorities? Will this prevent, will it keep me from living out and being true to my highest financial priorities? Could you imagine? Could you imagine the financial peace that we could all have and all experience if we would become savvy, savvy in the way that we handle our finances? God wants us to. And he wants to bless us. But we're going to have to choose to be savvy and be wise in making the most of what he blesses us with. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God that, that you provide for us. God, I, I pray that we would be able to be people today, that, that we would be joyful in the level of provision that you've provided for us. That we would be faithful in the way that we give you first what you've asked for. That we would be true to the needs of our family by, by being prepared for, for emergencies and, and having money set aside for that. And that we would live on a budget that has margin in it. God, convict us where we need to be convicted in the area of money. And may we be wise in the way that we steward and we manage all that comes our way. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.